Devil's Night, 2002. Jason Mazzell, better known to you as Jam Master J, sits in his Queens recording studio, the 45 next to him, apparently expecting trouble, and trouble soon came. We begin with a fatal shooting of a rap music legend. The shooting tonight in a recording studio in Queens, taking the life of the man known as Jam Master J, his real name, Jason Mizell, one of the founders of the groundbreaking rap group Run DMC. Jim Do came in the form of two gunmen who came into the studio. Apparently they were let in, so they, they knew the people at the studio. And there's conflicting reports as to whether one of the guys hugged Jam Master Jay or that they simply came in and one held the other people at bay while the younger man shot and murdered one of the most iconic uh, early hip hop stars, Jam Master J in his own studio. And since 02 up till now, 2020, it had been an unsolved mystery, but that's not true anymore. And it's really a, a sad story of which unfortunately, there's a lot in you know, rap business, but in entertainment business in general. Revelation number two was that Jam Master J was apparently a major cocaine trafficker. And prosecutors say he was murdered when he tried to cut one of his accomplices out of a drug deal. According to court papers filed on August 17th, 2020, a man named Ronald Washington and another guy named Carl Jordan Jr. were the ones who forced their way into Jason Mazzell's studio on Merrick Boulevard in Queens. As Washington forced someone inside the studio to the ground at gunpoint, the papers say uh, Mr. Jordan, a younger guy, fired a bullet into Jam Master Jay's head. Carl Jordan Jr., the alleged trigger man, was only 18 years old at the time. But investigators say when he resolved to cut one of his accomplices out of a major drug deal, that accomplice, identified as Ronald Washington, conspired with another man, identified as Carl Jordan, to murder Mizell. What we've alleged in that indictment is that on October 30th, 2002, nearly 20 years ago, Mr. Jordan and Mr. Washington uh, walked into a music studio uh, in Queens where uh, Mr. Mizell and others uh, were working essentially uh, and hanging out and they walked in and they murdered him in cold blood. Now if you're too young to remember how big of a deal Run DMC was back in the 80s uh, you know I was in elementary school in the mid 80s and like you know we would disrupt the class by spitting Run DMC lyrics you know in the middle of class like they were as big as Michael Jackson to us and along with probably LL Cool J I would say the most um, important people for bridging early hip hop into the mainstream and like the most popular pop music format it is today. There were other people that had, you know, radio hits, the Sugar Hill Gang, but like in terms of people that everybody liked and who had recurring great music, Run DMC was it. And Jam Master J, you know, is a holdover from a time when still every group had a DJ and DJs were a big deal. So I don't tend to care that much about, you know, rappers getting killed. I'm kind of numb to people getting killed in general, but Jam Master J got killed. It bothered me a lot more than Tupac or Biggie, for whatever reason. And uh, it also bothered me that it took so long to solve because apparently a lot of people in Queens and a lot of people that were Jay's so-called friends and family knew what was going on. There was a studio full of people and they were immediately suspects, but you know, no one, no one talked. And for all of you to believe in the no snitching thing, well, here's the thing. Either you kill the people that killed your friend or you go tell. To do nothing just makes you a victim. So this victim culture is really was not to be respected. So if you're not gonna tell, then and you know who did something and you don't like what they did, then you have to kill them. If you don't kill them for killing your people, then you're just a coward and a victim. And if you're not a gangster and you're victimized by murderers, you should go tell. But if you are a gangster or some type of street person, then you're supposed to kill them back. But nobody did anything about it and nobody told. And people like Russell Simmons, who made hundreds of million dollars in hip hop, apparently you know, didn't do enough to keep a guy like Jay out of the streets. Now, maybe that's not Russell Simmons' fault. I don't know. 
apparently J and Master J, and this is per the court filings, because uh, Jordan and Washington's uh, being charged with uh, J and Master J's murder was part of a, uh, I think a RICO indictment that also involved their cocaine dealing. And the reason the, 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 the murder supposedly happened was that Jay had been involved for some years in getting cocaine on consignment in New York and sending it to Maryland. Now his business partner in the studio and I guess in his general music business supposedly was in on the cocaine business. I don't think he's charged with it, so allegedly, if supposedly, and again, allegedly, supposedly, this guy had lost some money on a prior cocaine deal in Maryland, and he had his sister, this is a little tangled here, J. Master J's business partner had his sister take out a life insurance policy on J. So when J was killed, his sister got paid off on it. Now that might sound shady, people hear about life insurance policies, but you know, if you're from a lower income and no one you know or no one in your family has a life insurance policy, it sounds shady. But the reality is, in the real world, when people are making money, people have life insurance policies on their business partners, just like you do on your spouse. Because when people are dependent on each other for income, uh, you know, if the other person dies, it messes up your income. Now, I don't mean income of like going to the mall and buying jewelry, but your basic life income. So most normal people have business, uh, have life insurance policies. Doesn't necessarily mean this guy wanted Jay killed, though that's what some people say, but it is a fact that's what happened. As to whether the business part, as to whether the business partner was involved in any cocaine dealings with Jay, I don't know. So the indictment that uh, Carl Jordan Jr. and Ronald Washington were hit with, it had 10 counts, it was unsealed federal court and included cocaine dealing, I think money laundering, and the murder of J. Master J. Now, who were these guys? Ronald Washington uh, was already in prison serving time for some robberies or commercial burglaries. He's, I think, 56, which would have put him in his mid-30s at the time when it happened. And he, he was part of that whole Southeast Queens uh, gangster drug street hitman circuit that people like Supreme and Fat Cat, who uh, you know everyone's heard of, came out of, and he was supposedly someone that was feared, and I guess he had a distinctive tattoo that was noticed right, you know, at the night the murder happened, and that's what put the police onto him. But nobody would say they saw his face, so he's been in prison for some time now. Carl Jordan Jr., who was 18 when he was allegedly pulled the trigger on J Master J, uh, is was an aspiring rapper himself who like to take photos for his Instagram in front of, guess what, Jam Master J's mural, which is obviously um, a dark, uh, you know, little twist to this story, a morbid twist, but of course, it's well known that killers love to go back to the scene of their crime. In fact, at any murder scene, whether it's of a celebrity or just anybody, uh, the police, first thing they do is they look around at the onlookers because very often the person that did it is standing around. And I don't know if Carl, Jr., Carl Jordan Jr. stood around at the crime scene, but he certainly kept going back to the scene of the crime and, and uh, taking photos. And I think he even shot music video in front of J. Master J's mural. But of course, a lot of people did that. Now, Carl Jordan Jr.'s father, Carl Jordan Sr., was a one-time Def Jam executive. Now, what is an Def Jam executive? Well, you could be a real music person. You could be a street guy turned music person, like Bimmy Antney, who was part of the Supreme Team and went on to, from what I can tell, be a legitimate music industry executive. He had successes with different groups. He's made a career in the music industry. His uh, nephew, Waka Flocka Flame, his sister, Debbie Antney, who brought out Nicki Minaj and Waka Flocka and Gucci Man. I mean, these are people that have had real serious success in the music industry. So I wouldn't call Bimmy a street guy hiding in the music industry. I think he transitioned, you know, in a realistic way. But, you know, from stuff I read and heard, Carl Jordan Sr., maybe you know, I don't know, not so much he was somebody that I guess was feared over a Def Jam, but you know, what does all this stuff mean? Uh, 
So one of the rumors is that the business partner of J Master J somehow teamed up with this Carl Jordan Sr. to put the squeeze on J Master J for 10 kilos of cocaine that he got on consignment. But if Ronald Washington was, he's in prison for burglary robbery, well robbers, like one thing you know in the street, whatever somebody does, they do. So if you're a robber, why would you want to be in at my, my multi-kilo cocaine deal? Like that's a red flag. Robbers don't sell drugs. Drug dealers don't rob on a high level. So he sounds like somebody that was just brought in. And this Carl Jordan Sr. to use his own 18-year-old son, that's kind of dark, but you know, real serious gangster stuff runs in the family. That's the only way you become a real serious gangster. Quick sub story, for example, the Detroit Mafia, the founding fathers of the Detroit Mafia family, William Black Bill Toco and Joseph Joe Uno Zarelli, sent their two sons to college. You know, one thing, one went to Notre Dame, they went to like good schools. When they came back to Detroit in 1947, those two sons got made into the Detroit Mafia family by strangling to death. This is per the FBI, they were never charged with it. They're both dead now. Or no, yeah, they're both dead now. Um, strangling to death a Greek gambling czar named Gust Andromelis, who coincidentally was the boss of my street cousin's grandfather, but that's another story. Strangling this guy to death in front of their own fathers. So, Carl Jordan Sr. wouldn't be the first gangster to send his son to do a hit, if that's what happened. Now, I'm not sure if Carl Jordan Sr. is alive now, he might not be, I don't know. So, now, although prosecutors had tried to use the accusations against Washington in his sentencing on the robbery, uh, the defense attorney didn't take it seriously at the time. Uh, this was her quote. I had the sense that somebody whispered something in their ear to get themselves out of trouble, she said, adding that Mr. Washington had always said he was not the killer. When he heard the allegation, he was laughing. Federal law enforcement told the New York Times that, of course, they had multiple cooperating witnesses in this indictment, including this 18-year-old cold case murder. First to speculate, at first, law enforcement speculated that Jam Master Jay's killing has something to do with the then ongoing uh, murder inc. 50 Cent beef, because 50 Cent had been signed to Jam Master Jay, but uh, Jam Master Jay apparently didn't get any money out of uh, 50 Cent, a guy he had kind of taken from the street and, and groomed uh, at least the first step into the superstar he became. And maybe that's a testament to J Master J's poor business skills or the fact that he wasn't focused on music. He was supposedly in a lot of debt with the studio. I mean, he in 2002 when he was killed, uh, 50 Cent was really ascendant. Get Richard Die Trying, I think, was out or wasn't it out or about to come out? And he apparently didn't have a piece of 50 cents action, I guess. And he was still involved in the cocaine business. On the subject of late run DMC DJ and turntablist, 50 Cent expressed that his tenure with JMJ Records did not prove to be the relationship either party had hoped for. But he did, but he did take learnings from Jay. I started writing lyrics full time in 1997, he said. I met Jam Master J from Run DMC and he had his label, which would take people on and develop them until they were ready to go to a major. Artists developed through JMJ included Onyx and J.O. Felony from the West Coast. J taught me how to count bars and when the chorus should start and stop and I kept practicing. Sometimes hard work beats talent. That's what 50 Cent had to say about himself. J Master J coincidentally was married to a woman named Terry Corley, the sister of Wall Corley, who was another one of the big names from the Southeast Jamaica drug scene in the 80s. You may have heard him referenced in different rap songs. Wall Corley just did another prison sentence for a drug conspiracy. He was referred to on the streets as a ghost. I don't know if that's what inspired power. So J Master J, I mean, I, you know, I don't know, was he doing anything with the Corley family, but it's interesting that he married a woman that was the sister of a big drug family. I mean, usually, I mean, it's kind of like a mafia thing, right? I mean, people involved in very serious crime over generations, 
you know, you don't just marry squares. I mean, you have to kind of be in that whole loop of people so you can be trusted. So who knows, maybe Jam Master J. I mean, I do remember from like the Beat, what was it called? The Beat Magazine or the different like urban teen music magazines I used to look at in the 80s. Like, you know, I remember in like 84, Jam Master J always had his beeper on. And like, if you had a beeper in 1984, like you were either a doctor or you sold drugs. I mean, I don't even really remember many rappers having them, but I don't know. Maybe Jam Master J had been in it all along. I don't know. 50 Cent had this to say about his long ago mentor. I think Jay liked me cause I looked like the lyrics. I had all the jewelry. I looked like a hustler. I'd been on the street so long people respected me. The honest truth is at that point, the drug dealers were the leaders of the neighborhood. They had more money than the rappers. The things LL Cool J and Run DMC wanted were the things guys hustling already had. Now, of course, the artists are way richer than the dealers. The hip hop culture has grown so much. Well, 50 Cent's right with that, I guess. But Jam Master J, maybe he was a part of both groups and he didn't make the transition, even though he apparently had the opportunity to. And unfortunately, I guess he paid with his life for it. Unfortunately, Jam Master J Mazel never did quite get rich, but he did die trying. R.I.P. Jam Master J, American Dope.